John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, two of the most pivotal figures in early American history, began their relationship as allies and collaborators. However, over the course of their careers, political differences transformed them into rivals. Their relationship is symbolic of the larger conflicts in the early republic, reflecting the clash between competing visions for the future of the United States. Adams and Jefferson first crossed path in 1775 during the Second Continental Congress, but they both emerged as staunch advocates for American independence. Despite coming from different backgrounds, Adams from Massachusetts, the heart of the revolutionary fervor, and Jefferson from the more aristocratic Virginia, their commitment to the cause of liberty bonded them. Adams recognized Jefferson's extraordinary talent early on. When the Congress decided to draft the Declaration of Independence in 1776, Adams persuaded his fellow delegates that Jefferson was the ideal person to lead the task. Adams was aware that his own blunt and often harsh style of speech and writing would not win the support of many delegates. He wisely believed that Jefferson could craft a document that would unite the colonies and articulate the case for independence. Adams, though much more experienced in public service at the time, was humble enough to step aside and let Jefferson take the lead in drafting the declaration. Jefferson's draft, with some edits from Adams and others, became one of the most famous documents in history. This collaboration laid the foundation for their friendship and Adams expressed great admiration for Jefferson's abilities. The two men shared a sense of destiny, believing that their actions would shape the future of not only America, but the world. Following the American Revolution, Adams and Jefferson both served as diplomats in Europe, further strengthening their bond. In 1784, they found themselves in France, where they worked to negotiate trade agreements and maintain good relations with European powers. Their wives, Abigail Adams and Martha Jefferson, also became close during this time deepening the personal connections between the two families. During their time abroad, Jefferson and Adams continued to admire one another's strengths. Adams, known for his sharp legal mind and fiery patriotism, saw Jefferson as a brilliant philosopher and visionary thinker. Jefferson, in turn, respected Adams' practical wisdom and unwavering commitment to the cause of liberty. They complemented each other well, with Adams representing the pragmatic side of diplomacy and Jefferson embodying the idealistic hopes of the new republic. However, even during this period of close collaboration, differences in their political uh, philosophies began to emerge. Adams was increasingly concerned about the need for a strong central government to maintain order and protect the young nation from external threats. Jefferson, on the other hand, had a more optimistic view of human nature and believed that decentralized power with a focus on individual liberties and states' rights was the best way to ensure freedom. These early philosophical differences were subtle and did not interfere with their friendship. In fact, their time in Europe was one of mutual admiration and shared vision. They spent long evenings discussing the future of the Republic and the ideals of the Enlightenment, which both men embraced. Yet, the seeds for future conflict were being planted during these discussions as they began to see that they had different ideas about how those Enlightenment ideals should be applied in practice. The Philadelphia Convention of 1787, which neither Adams nor Jefferson attended due to their diplomatic duties marked a significant turning point in American history. This convention produced the U.S. Constitution, a document that fundamentally reshaped the government of the United States, replacing the weak Articles of Confederation with a much stronger central government. Both Adams and Jefferson, observing the events from abroad, had reservations about the new constitution. Adams was concerned about the lack of checks on the power of the executive, while Jefferson worried that the document gave too much power to the federal government at the expense of the states and individual rights. Despite their concerns, both men ultimately supported the ratification of the Constitution, recognizing that it was a necessary improvement over the Articles of Confederation. 
When Adams returned to the United States in 1788, he quickly became involved in the new government, serving as the first vice president under George Washington. Jefferson, still in France, watched from afar as the new government took shape. Upon his return in 1789, Jefferson was appointed as Washington's Secretary of State, placing him once again in close proximity to Adams, now the Vice President. However, the political landscape in the United States had changed dramatically since the days of their early friendship. The Federalist Party, led by Alexander Hamilton and supported by Adams, advocated for a strong central government, a robust financial system, and close ties with Britain. Jefferson, leading the opposition with his Democratic Republican Party, envisioned a more decentralized government with a focus on agriculture, states' rights, and a stronger alignment with the revolutionary France. By 1800, the political divide between Adams and Jefferson had reached its peak. Adams, who had succeeded George Washington as the second president of the United States, was leading the Federalist Party while Jefferson, his vice president, had become the leader of the opposition Democratic Republicans. The unity that uh, had once been symbolized by George Washington's presidency was gone, replaced by fierce partisan warfare. The Federalists, under Adams, sought to strengthen the central government and maintain order in the face of domestic and foreign threats. They believed that the United States needed a strong government to defend itself against the anarchy of the French Revolution and the growing uh, radicalism within their own country. Adams and his supporters, including Alexander Hamilton, enacted measures such as Alien and Sedition Acts to suppress uh, decent and maintain control. The Democratic Republicans, led by Jefferson, viewed these measures as tyrannical and an assault on the very freedoms that the American Revolution had fought to secure. Jefferson and his followers used the press to launch scathing attacks uh, on the Federalists, accusing them of undermining the Constitution and steering the nation toward monarchy. They argued that Adams and the Federalists were betraying the ideals of the Revolution by aligning too closely with Britain and by suppressing individual liberties. The 1800 presidential election became a defining moment in the American political history. Jefferson challenged Adams for the presidency, marking the first time that a sitting president faced a serious electoral challenge from his own vice president. The election was fiercely contested, with both sides accusing the other of endangering the future of the republic. Federalists painted Jefferson as a dangerous radical who would bring the chaos of the French Revolution to American shores, while Democratic Republicans accused Adams of monarchist tendencies and authoritarianism. The election of the 1800 was not just a personal battle between Adams and Jefferson, but a critical test of the new American political system. The Federalists and Democratic Republicans clashed over virtually every issue, from foreign policy and the role of the federal government to the direction of the nation's economy. The Federalists, representing the commercial interests of the North and East, favored a strong central government and close ties with Britain. In contrast, the Democratic Republicans, who drew their support from the agrarian South and West, advocated for states' rights, an alliance with revolutionary France, and a vision of an agricultural republic. Complicating matters further, was the infamous electoral flaw in the original constitution. Both Jefferson and his running mate Aaron Barr received the same number of electoral votes, leading to a tie. Under the constitution, the election was thrown to the House of Representatives where it took 36 ballots before Jefferson was finally chosen as president, thanks in part to support from Federalist congressmen who feared Barr more than Jefferson. The election of 1800 was a watershed moment in American history. It marked the first peaceful transfer of power between political parties, a momentous event that demonstrated the resilience of the young republic. Jefferson, 
who saw his victory as a revolution akin to the one fought in 1776, celebrated it as a triumph of the will of the people and a rejection of federalist elitism. The federalists, who had dominated the government since its inception, never fully recovered from their defeat in 1800. Adams, bitter and humiliated by his loss, retired to his farm in Massachusetts, leaving the state to Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans. Jefferson's vision for the United States was fundamentally different from that of his Federalist predecessors. Whereas Adams and Hamilton had focused on building a strong central government, a national bank, and a powerful military, Jefferson believed in limited government, personal liberty, and an agrarian-based society. His inaugural address in 1801 called for unity, famously stating, and I quote, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists, end of quote. Jefferson sought to calm the fears of his Federalist opponents, assuring them that he would not dismantle the government but would instead return it to the principles of the revolution. One of the Jefferson's first acts as president was to allow the controversial Alien and Sedition Acts to expire, signaling his commitment to civil liberties and limited government. He also worked to reduce the national debt, cut military spending, and repeal the excise taxes that had been imposed by the Federalists. His goal was to create a government that was wise and frugal, one that would leave people free to pursue their own happiness with minimal interference from the federal government. Jefferson's presidency was also notable for its informal style. In contrast to the elaborate ceremonies and rituals favored by the Federalists, Jefferson presented himself as a man of the people. He walked to his inauguration rather than arriving in a carriage, and famously received foreign diplomats at the White House while dressed in sleepers and a robe. This down-to-earth approach endeared him to many Americans who saw Jefferson as a champion of the common man. The Louisiana Purchase, a landmark achievement during Jefferson's presidency, doubled the size of the United States and laid the foundation for westward expansion, solidifying the nation's power. To understand its impact, we must examine its geopolitical context, the negotiations, and its far-reaching consequences. In 1801, the U.S. western boundary was the Mississippi River, with Louisiana originally claimed by France under Spanish control. The region, especially New Orleans, was crucial for American commerce as it controlled access to the Gulf of Mexico. Through the Pinckney Treaty of 1795, Americans had navigation rights on the Mississippi. However, in 1800, Napoleon Bonaparte secretly regained Louisiana from Spain, alarming Jefferson, who feared French control would threaten U.S. trade and security. Napoleon envisioned using Louisiana to support his Caribbean colonies, but faced setbacks due to the Haitian Revolution, which weakened French power in the Americas. Jefferson initially aimed to secure access to New Orleans, especially after Spain briefly closed the port in 1802. He sent James Monroe to join U.S. Ambassador Robert Livingston in Paris to negotiate for New Orleans, offering up to 10 million. However, Napoleon, facing financial strains and abandoning his American empire plans, offered the entire Louisiana territory for 15 million, roughly 4 cents per acre. The offer was unexpected, but Monroe and Livingstone seized the opportunity. The purchase presented Jefferson with a constitutional dilemma. As a strict constructionist, he had long argued that the federal government should only exercise powers explicitly granted by the Constitution, which did not mention acquiring new territories. However, Jefferson justified the purchase under the President's treaty-making powers and Congress approved it. On December 20th, 1803, the U.S. officially took control of Louisiana. The purchase immediately doubled the size of the United States, securing control of the Mississippi River 
and New Orleans vital for trade. It removed France as a threat in North America and reduced Spanish influence. This acquisition paved the way for westward expansion and future policies like Manifest Destiny. Jefferson organized the Lewis and Clark expedition to explore the new territory and seek a route to the Pacific. From 1804 to 1806, their journey provided crucial information about the region's geography, resources, and Native American cultures, laying the groundwork for future settlement. The Louisiana Purchase had long-term effects on American politics and society. It raised the contentious issue of whether slavery would expand into new territories, a debate that ultimately led to the Civil War. For Native Americans, the purchase led to increased conflicts, displacement and forced removal as settlers encroached on their lands. Jefferson saw the purchase as fulfilling his vision of an agrarian republic, though it exposed contradictions in his views on liberty and equality, especially with the expansion of slavery and the treatment of Native Americans. Despite their intense political rivalry, Adams and Jefferson rekindled their friendship in the years following Jefferson's presidency. In 1812, Adams initiated a correspondence with Jefferson that would last for the rest of their lives. Through their letters, they reflected on their shared experiences, the struggles for uh, the American Revolution, and the philosophical differences that had once divided them. Their letters revealed two aging statesmen who had come to terms with their roles in shaping the nation's history. Although they continued to disagree on many issues, they expressed a deep mutual respect for each other's contributions to the founding of the Republic. As they approached the end of their lives, Adams and Jefferson seemed to understand that their legacies were intertwined and that their rivalry had in many ways defined the early republic. Both men died on July 4, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence.